I'm going to go ahead and get started. So my name is uh, Alan Schroeder, and I'm co-chair of this session along with Rajni Matthew from Pediatric Infectious Disease, and I'm from uh, Hospital Medicine and Critical Care, and uh, very excited for today's talk. Uh, we've, we've had a number of sessions previously on the extrapulmonary manifestations of COVID, uh, focusing in prior talks on the heart, and the brain and nervous system. And then today we're gonna condense a couple other organ systems uh, into one talk. And we have a great panel of speakers that uh, Dr. Matthew will tell you about shortly. Um, as usual, you can get CME here and we will put that CME link in the, in the chat as well. Um, and that is a text code to that number. And please put your questions in the Q&A and not the chat. And we will try to address those after each talk. Upcoming sessions, we have a really exciting talk next week, uh, really up to date uh, with some information uh, from Dr. Grace Lee from the uh, ACIP meetings and uh, Dr. Ann Arvin, who is a world expert on virology and, and Dr. Matthew will be a part of that, pan <coughs> that panel that I will moderate. And we're gonna talk about uh, what we know about vaccines and kids and how things are gonna look uh, over the next few months. So uh, really, I hope, um, an educational talk for everybody. Um, you can stop screen sharing and Dr. Matthew, uh, if you can introduce our speakers. Thank you, Dr. Schroeder. Um, today we have a very um, exciting session. Um, our pan we uh, want to thank our panelists for joining us, uh, Dr. Tu, Dr. Roberts, and Dr. Patel. Um, we will have Dr. Tu go first um, and a brief introduction about Dr. Joanna Tu. She's a resident in dermatology at Stanford. She's going to be graduating this year and going to go on to do a Peds Dermatology Fellowship at uh, UCSF. Uh, welcome, Dr. Tu, and you can take it from here. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everybody. Like uh, Dr. Matthew was saying, I'm Joanna, one of the third year Durham residents. Thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about skin manifestations of COVID-19 in children. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose, but we'll be upfront and honest with three major caveats that I'm still a resident and learning more every day. Um, two is that our understanding of COVID-19 is constantly evolving. And lastly, I'm so grateful to have received the second dose of my COVID-19 vaccine yesterday, but admittedly, I'm not feeling 100%. So um, apologies if I'm a little bit less chipper than usual. Um, and I feel like that's probably the longest I've spent on a disclosure slide. So thank you for your patience. Um, as a quick overview, I'll be going over the reported skin findings in children with COVID-19, followed by a brief discussion of cutaneous findings in multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, or MISI, and then um, I'll conclude with a topic that you've probably all heard about, COVID toes. And so to start, um, I'll have a brief poll of which of the following findings have not been associated with COVID-19, aquaperniosis, urticaria, maculopapular rash, vesicular exanthem, targetoid lesions, or none. All of the above have been reported with COVID-19 infections. From that answer, it looked like most of you selected, yes, none of, um, none. All of the above have been reported with COVID-19. And then I will get to the second question later, um, but most of you selected chill blame lupus erythematosus. So we'll discuss that one later. But um, basically, similar to all other viruses, um, there have been a number of different rashes that have been associated with COVID-19. And as a dermatologist, I really like unique primary morphology, especially if you can help to guide diagnosis. But really, our understanding on specific cutaneous findings in the setting of COVID-19 is still evolving. And so the graphic on the left is um, from a report that came out early from Italy that described basically 20% of adults with COVID-19 having different types of cutaneous findings. Um, and notably, the presence of a rash did not correlate with disease severity. Um, and although many of the more common virally associated findings have been reported, such as urticaria or hives or a more biliform eruption. Um, these are fairly common and can be related to either COVID-19 infection or other viral infections. And so because those are less certain, I'll be focusing on two more unique morphologies today, primarily vesicular lesions and erythema multiform. And so vesicular uh, exanthem or vesicular lesions have been reported in both adults and children. And in a series of 22 patients in Italy, consisting of 21 adults and one child, erythematous papules and scattered vesicles were reported appearing varicella-like predominantly over the trunk, as you can see in these photos. The face, genitals, mucous membranes, and limbs were mostly spared, and biopsies were compatible with viropathic changes. 
More generally, although there isn't a consensus on what's being reported as vesicular exanthem in the literature, which is one of the limitations of some of the um, early reports of COVID-19, it has been reported in multiple countries in confirmed or suspected COVID-19 cases. And as this is a COVID-19 in children series, here are some um, closer images of the vesicular exanthems reported in children. I wanted to highlight this morphology because we typically think of varicella when we see vesicles in a pediatric patient. The child on the left is the one that was included in the initial report that I mentioned of the 22 patients. Um, and this was an eight-year-old female that had presented with a three-day history of asymptomatic papulovesicular skin eruption. And her past medical history was notable for a varicella infection one year earlier. And so two days after her presentation, essentially at day five of rash, she had developed a mild fever. And three days later, her whole family, her father, mother, and grandmother all developed fever and cough and all tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 uh, via nasal pharyngeal swab. And the photo on the right is a close-up of another pediatric patient's morphology. And here you can see some more clustered pink papules, some with overlying super vis superficial vesiculation and hemorrhagic testing. And so while the pathogenesis of the vesicular exanthem is unknown, um, some of these studies have also reported that it's very important that you exclude other viral infections as well, such as HSV, HHV, VZV, parvovirus, and EBV. And so the next type of morphology that we'll discuss in the setting of COVID-19 is erythema multiform. So this is an acute self-limiting hypersensitivity condition that's characterized by the abrupt onset of symmetric fixed red papules favoring the acrofacial areas that can evolve into either typical or atypical targets. And so typical targets are reminiscent of this well-known logo and mainstay of pandemic shopping. Um, and basically they have three distinct zones. So two concentric rings of color change that are well defined and the central portion can appear dusky or even bolus. And then atypical targets um, have two zones or a poorly defined border. Classically, EM is most commonly precipitated by infection in 90% of cases, and it's usually triggered by HSV or mycoplasma pneumoniae. And this table here is a review of the possible triggers, which as you can see are many. And so during this pandemic, an EM-like eruption has been associated with COVID-19 in both adults and children. And in children, most reports describe that those with EM-like lesions have otherwise been asymptomatic or had only mild respiratory or GI symptoms. Notably, testing was not always performed and when performed was not consistently positive. Here you can see photos of the cases that have been reported with either typical or atypical targets over the dorsal hands and extensor surfaces. And here there's some more targetoid papules in addition to some perk indurated plaques consistent with acral perniosis over the distal fingers. Interestingly, in immunohistochemistry state for the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein on biopsies from these um, EM-like lesions showed granular positivity in both the endothelial cells and epithelial cells of equine glands. And so um, in terms of other than uh, the maculopapular eruptions, urticaria, vesicular eruptions, and targetoid lesions, um, more more cutaneous findings have also been reported. So vasculopathic rashes with purpuric thrombocytopenic purpura, dengue-like exanthem, acroischemia, and lividoid eruption. Most of these have been linked to COVID-19 in adults, but have also been described in children. And um, pityriasis rosea-like eruptions have also been reported, although it's unclear from the reports if these were truly from COVID-19 versus reactivation of HHV6. And in the interest of time, I won't spend too long discussing enanthems or mucosal findings, but in brief, oral cavity findings were also reported in a number of adults with COVID-19, including macroglossia, anterior papillitis, and palatal petechia that weren't associated with thrombocytopenia. And to summarize sort of that overview of the different types of um, rashes that have been associated, COVID-19 has basically been reported with all but the kitchen sink when talking about different morphologies. And as we learn more about the virus, we may get some more clarity in terms of specific findings and morphologies associated with this virus. And so moving on to myth. C, which I know has been previously discussed in the series. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but want to show some photos from the literature of cutaneous findings since the CDC case definition includes skin as one of the organ systems that can be involved, but doesn't specify morphology. Um, and mostly in the reports and literature, the mucocutaneous findings of MISI are similar to those that are described in Kawasaki disease, such as conjunctival injection in strawberry tongue with lip hyperemia palmoplantar erythema and periorbital erythema and edema, 
and as well as polymorphous rashes. And so um, they described the one on the left as scarlatiniform and um, the one on the right as morbilliform um, and also urticarial eruptions and um, lacy and reticulated lividoid erythema. And in this case report of a toddler with Missy, she has scattered macules and papules, some appearing almost reticulated over the lower extremities, as well as some lip hyperemia with cracking and facial edema. And interestingly, in this adolescent fitting the criteria for Missy, his skin findings appear targetoid and consistent with EM. And his ELISA for COVID antibodies were positive for IgA and IgG, and he had additional infectious workup as well, which was negative for mycoplasma, EBV, HSV, adenovirus, and parvovirus. And so switching gears to a topic that I'm sure that all of you have heard of, COVID toes. Uh, um, around the start of the pandemic, there was a whole slew of pictures um, of toes that really took over popular media. And um, we had already done this poll, but basically, uh, which of these is not like the other. And so I wanted to sort of discuss the different terminology because you may hear the names used interchangeably. And so just to review, um, and you guys had all, most of you had picked chilblain lupus erythematosus, which is correct, um, but also lupus pernio is a separate entity. And so for reference, lupus pernio is cutaneous sarcoidosis, and um, chilblain's lupus erythematosus is a form of chronic cutaneous lupus. And so what is pernio or chilblains? It's basically an abnormal inflammatory response to cold, damp, and non-freezing conditions. It's been reported sort of throughout history, starting even as early as 1881, um, and is thought to be triggered by vascular ischemia caused by prolonged vasoconstriction in the setting of extended cold exposure. It can be a primary disorder or secondary to other conditions such as cryoproteinemia, malignancies, and connective tissue disease. Um, and also some patients that have type 1 interferonopathies, which I'll discuss a little bit later on, um, such as Icardi Gutierrez syndrome, familial chablain lupus, or sting-associated vasculopathy of infantile onset, or SAVI, can also develop pernio-like lesions. And so at the start of the pandemic, cases of pernio were on the rise, and the chilblains like lesions were colloquially called COVID toes. This flurry of cases started in Europe with reports of COVID toes coinciding with or just following the initial surge of SARS-CoV-2 infections in Spain, Italy, and France. A common theme among these reports was that affected patients were young with mild or no viral symptoms and improved spontaneously. In retrospective studies in France and Spain, chilblain-like lesions were found to be the most frequent cutaneous findings in a mix of either confirmed or suspected cases. A similar trend of chilblain like lesions coinciding with SARS CoV 2 positivity rate is charted here for Wisconsin. This slide is courtesy of Dr. Arkin and her group there. Um, and it's notable that reports of perennial like lesions decreased as the weather warmed despite slightly increasing positivity rates in July. So we talked a little bit about idiopathic perineal being related to cold, damp conditions, and also about this temporal relationship with the COVID 19 pandemic and increased reports of perineal. There have been many reports of um, pernio or COVID toes, and I won't go into all of them in detail, but wanted to include some published clinical images of what are being called COVID toes that look consistent with pernio, as well as some of the relevant lab results. And so the photos on the left are from a case report of a child in Minnesota who presented with erythematous and edematous toes with some localized violaceous vesicular changes six weeks after a febrile illness. This patient was negative by PCR testing for COVID-19, but was positive for COVID-19 IgG. On the right are images of a similar violaceous macules and papules, some with overlying bola and crusting from a retrospective review of 22 children and adolescents um, in Spain during the peak of COVID-19. And of these, only 10 had mild respiratory or GI symptoms and none had fever. Um, all their labs were normal in the patients that were tested and 19 cases were tested for COVID-19 and only one was positive. In an Italian case series, 14 cases of pernio were reported in children and young adults, and lab workup was normal, and EBV, CMV, Coxsackie, and Parvo were excluded. Um, five patients were tested for COVID-19, and all were negative, and no family history of COVID-19-related symptoms were reported. To test the hypothesis that pernio represents a late manifestation of COVID-19 in young and healthy subjects, they examined 107 hospitalized adults um, positive for COVID-19, um, and that none were found to have perniosis. And more locally, a case series from UCSF reporting on two families with three siblings each described mild URI symptoms or contact with symptomatic individuals one to two weeks preceding the development of red to violaceous macules and dusky papules over the distal toes and heels. 
Biopsies from these six patients looked identical to idiopathic pernia with no evidence of vasculitis or thromboembolus. COVID-19 testing in these patients were negative, but notably were performed one to two weeks after the onset of URI symptoms. And the case series also describes that within the course of that week, um, 24 additional cases of pernia were presented and 13 of 24 of those had testing for COVID-19 and were negative. And so some of you may have already picked up on this trend in terms of from these reports uh, that mainly most of these cases had negative COVID testing. And so where do we stand on COVID toes and whether or not it's a true entity? So on one hand, there's this temporal relationship of COVID um, case increases with pernio, but this may have also correlated with lifestyle changes with lockdowns as more people were indoors, sedentary and barefoot and may represent an epiphenomenon. And while many of the tests are negative in the reported cases of pernio, we also note that in studies of children admitted to hospitals with suspicion for COVID-19, about 11% of cases tested positive by PCR. And so it's possible that pernio is a late manifestation when viral RNA is no longer detectable by PCR. However, serologic testing for antibodies was also frequently negative, but there have also been some reports of prospective studies where previously negative by PCR patients then tested positive by ELISA for antibodies. Additionally, there is some, there is a, some plausible mechanisms for the development of COVID toes the most compelling of which is virus-induced type 1 interferonopathies. And so we know that interferon production is higher in children and adolescents, and COVID-19 is a potent trigger of the expression of type 1 interferon, and that strong interferon response may attenuate viral replication, but also induce microangiopathic changes leading to chill blains. And um, the role of interferon in chill blains is supported by the fact that chill blains are the most consistent feature of those type 1 interferon, inherited type 1 interferonopathies that we discussed a little bit earlier, such as Icardi Gutierrez, familial chilblain lupus, and SAVI. However, this hypothesis also doesn't explain the delay from suspected COVID symptoms to the appearance of pernio, um, the absence of other interferonopathy-related symptoms, nor does it explain the rarity of chilblains in children and teenagers with other viral illnesses that may also um, trigger similar interferon release. Some more recent studies have suggested that immunohistochemical stains for SARS-CoV-2 spike protein are positive in biopsies of chilblains. But other follow-up analyses have not been able to identify the SARS-CoV-2 RNA by PCR in the skin, um, and standardized immunostains are still lacking. And so essentially, we have a very boring seesaw, and the jury is still out while more research is needed. And in, in the meantime, it's still unclear if COVID toes is really a true entity. Some upcoming studies to look out for are perspective, is a prospective study looking at the role of interferon in COVID toes, um, as well as the pediatric specific registry regarding acral proniosis and COVID-19. This registry already had 420 patients enter from multiple countries between the months of April and October of last year. And the preliminary results, courtesy of Dr. Um, Castello Socio, similarly shows a low percentage of both positive PCR and antibody testing. It'll be interesting to see results of further studies with more standardized testing available. And so if you have patients to add to the registry, I recommend that you take a look at some of the germ registries that I've listed here, um, and it would be very helpful for bettering our understanding of this disease. And so thank you so much for your attention. I'd like to thank my um, faculty mentors and um, additional faculty that helped me prepare for this talk. Um, here are my references, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Dr. Tu, um, we have a question from the audience. Um, is numbness part of COVID toes and is neuropathy an issue with COVID toes? Yeah, so that's a great, great question. So usually with the um, COVID toes or the reports of COVID toes in the literature, a lot of them sort of report either some mild pruritus or some mild pain. Um, neuropathy has been reported in um, some of the reports with sort of like more endothelial damage, but I don't think that as part of pernio, it's like classically associated. Thank you so much. Uh, now we'll move on to Dr. Roberts. Uh, Dr. Tano Roberts is an assistant professor in pediatric ophthalmology at Stanford. Uh, and she will share with us about pediatric eye health during COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for the invite and letting our department come and uh, share with you guys some of the stuff that, that we're seeing. And I'm guessing a lot of you who have kids doing uh, Zoom school right now may have some questions about. So thank you for, uh, for joining us today. 
Um, so I don't have any financial disclosures for this talk. And one thing um, from a clinical perspective that we've really noticed is that COVID and being home during a pandemic has really changed how kids use their eyes and, and what they're doing with their eyes throughout the day. And so, you know, these kids are going through at home learning and a lot of Zoom school. And so, you know, you have some kids that are in their bed in the dark and they're using their screens. You have other kids who might be, you know, in the kitchen. Um, you, we all have seen these kids. We're, we're never sure what these little guys are doing. Um, but everybody's doing something different. But one of the biggest things that's in common is they're using screens and they're using their eyes up close a lot. So one of the biggest questions that we're getting right now from a clinician's perspective, and I, I probably answer this question, you know, over half my day when I'm seeing patients, is, is all the screen time going to be bad for my kids' eyes? And, um, and, the, and the answer, you know, is yes. Well, probably. And, and, and really, if we're being honest, it's, um, you know, um, maybe it'll be bad for their eyes. And so there's a few caveats to think about as we go, as we go through this. So with the increase in screen time, when it comes to their near work and what they're doing up close, really we're asking these kids to have this sustained focus. And it's this increased sustained focus that occurs when these kids are at home, more so when they're in the classroom. They also have a decreased blink rate. And we most of the studies that have looked at this have been done in adults because most kids are not spending a lot of time on screens. However, now that um, COVID's going on and kids are on screens a lot, they're getting a decreased blink rate as well. And one of the biggest problems is that the time that these kids are not spending outside has gone down. So they have this decreased outdoor time. And that's actually really important. So, um, what we're seeing in kids that we typically used to only see in adults is what we call computer vision syndrome or digital eye strain. And this can sort of present in a lot of different ways. One of the most common things that occurs is dry eyes. So these kids will have kind of red, irritated eyes. Sometimes they'll have extra tearing because the eye gets dry. And so there's a reflex that kicks, kicks in through the cornea that says, hey, my eye is dry, send extra tears. And those extra tears aren't really good tears that get sent to the eye. And so you get extra tearing. And, and that always sounds a little bit weird when you explain that to a parent um, to try to say, I, I realize that they're tearing a lot, but it's actually because their eye is dry. And so that, that doesn't always make sense to them. But, but that's a really common symptom of computer vision syndrome. Uh, another thing that we're getting is a lot of kids with, with neck and shoulder pain. Um, we have several kids come in with abnormal head positions that they're coming in with. And after talking to the parent for a while and we rule out any cranial nerve palsies or any muscle imbalances, it's because they've been, you know, the, the way that they're sitting at home and watching their screens um, is in sort of an odd position and it's causing some kinks in their necks and stuff like that. Um, a lot of eye strain, as you can imagine. So all of us, we're used to getting a lot of eye strain um, if we're on the computer for hours and hours and hours. And now we're asking these young kids to do this. So there's a lot of eye strain and a lot of headaches that are associated with all this increase in, in screen time. And then also blurred vision. So, you know, it's a combination, I think, of over-focusing, of their eyes drying out, and all of those happening all at once that, that's causing some blurred vision. One of the, the really big hot topics that um, we're concerned about actually, in addition to all the computer vision um, issues and the eye strain issues is actually an increase in myopia or an increase in nearsightedness. And so um, for those of you who are um, unaware a little bit of what myopia is, the top part of this diagram shows a normal eye. And so when you're looking at a target, uh, the light gets focused right on the back of the retina and it's uh, focused perfectly and we can see clearly. If we're myopic, when light goes into the eye, then it means that we're nearsighted. And so we can only see things clearly when they're up close. And if we look far away, it's blurry. And it's blurry because light gets focused inside of the eye. And so you can notice here that this is a really good illustration that the top, um, the top eye has the same focusing power essentially as the bottom eye. So it kind of comes to a tip in the same spot. The problem though, is that the eye is actually Actually longer in a myopic eye. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but it's actually a really big public health concern. It's not just, oh, they're nearsighted, now they need glasses to be able to see clearly far away. It's actually a health concern and particularly an ocular health concern. 
And so the, the reason that, that we worry about this is if we look at some of the data for vision impairment for uh, patients who are older than 50 years of age, you can see here that the prevalence of vision impairment is you know about three and a half to four percent. And so that's a, a lot of people worldwide. But if you look at on this graph here, the part of the graph that takes up the most space is this refractive air piece. And this refractive air piece is almost exclusively due to myopia or nearsightedness. And so what happens is as the eye grows longer, you don't get new retina and you don't get extra retinal cells. And so the retina gets stretched across the back of the eye and you can end up with retinal detachments. You can end up with different maculopathies um, where you end up not being able to see well with your best central vision. And for kids, we used to think for a long time, oh, no big deal. You just update their glasses and then they can see again. But the problem is these kids grow up and become adults. And when they're adults, they're at risk for having all of these vision um, issues because of their myop myopia. And a lot of those issues may be blinding, actually. And so um, we're, we're really trying to slow the rate of myopia. Myopia, you know, I, I'm myopic. Uh, I think probably many people on this call are myopic. Um, and But there's a difference between just being myopic or having myopia versus having high myopia. So high myopia is defined as having more than six diopters of myopia, um, whereas just kind of regular myopia is having less than that. And so you can see if, if we you look at the graph right here and we look at the number of people in millions and we look at projections that have been made out to 2050, we see that the rate of myopia is just increasing and increasing and incre increasing over time. And the same thing is happening with the patients who are or with individuals that have high myopia, although thankfully it's not increasing at the same rate because the, the uh, individuals with high myopia are the ones at most risk um, uh, for problems and vision loss due to the myopia. And so, you know, for from a from a pediatric perspective, one of our goals is to try to slow myopia down. Now, once kids are myopic, they're myopic. We can't reverse myopia. We can't make the eye shrink. We can only try to keep it from growing longer, faster. And so we want to try to figure out how we can slow that down. And there's a lot of risk factors that, that come into play when it comes to um, developing myopia, as well as increasing in myopia once these kids have myopia. So one of the, the big prevention issues is the, these kids are spending less time outside. So especially in urban areas, there aren't as many places for kids to go outside and they're spending more and more time indoors, um, particularly during COVID because they're now all of their education is indoors. And when you talk to parents and you ask them now during COVID how often they're spending, how much time they're spending inside relative to before, and it's actually a lot more now because they're not going out for recess, they're not going to school, so they're not getting outside during that time, they're not getting outside for lunch or after school, and so these kids are staying indoors more and more and more. Once kids have myopia, um, they're at a higher risk for increasing and becoming more myopic when they have a close working distance. So when kids, you know, they hold these things really close to their eyes, we get that all the time, wondering if that's a problem. Yes, it is. Um, we don't want kids to hold things too close to their eyes. But one of the problems, and I think this, this lower picture really illustrates it, is this little guy is holding this phone really close to his eyes but he's a little guy and his arms are only this long. So it's a lot harder for him to hold these handheld devices further away from his eyes. And so we really need to think about that and on advising um, parents to try to hold things on stands, et cetera, and giving a larger working distance for these kids. The other thing that is a, is a big risk factor is having extended reading time. So reading more than 45 minutes with uninterrupted breaks, particularly if that time is spent at a close working distance or, or, to, or closer than they should be anyways. And the distance that we really want them at is around 16 inches. So 16 to 20 inches is ideal. But again, for these little ones, that, that's hard. Their little arms aren't even that long. But those are some of our environmental risk factors that either um, and get myopia started or um, get it to progress even quicker. So what are some things that we can do to prevent myopia? And um, one of the things that's the, the one of the largest risk factors for developing myopia is having two parents that are myopic. 
And uh, one of uh, Carla Zadnik, she's a dean at Ohio State University, and she's been doing myopia research for years and years. And whenever she talks about this, she always says that, you know, on we need to add a question on online dating apps to make sure that myopes aren't where, marrying myopes. Because if you have two parents who are myopic, you're a seven times um, increase in the chances of your children being myopic. And so, so she would advocate that that's one of the first things that you could do. But, uh, but in, in real life, though, uh, one of the biggest things you can do and, and we can do for our kids is to get them outside. So there's a lot of evidence now that suggests that kids um, prior to the onset of myopia, um, if they even develop myopia, is that they spend more time outside than the kids who develop myopia. Now, we don't know a whole lot about once the kids develop myopia, does out time, outdoor time help prevent it from increasing? The, the data is a little bit less, um, it's a little bit more ambiguous for that. But as far as preventing myopia, we know that outdoor time seems to be protective. And so the more and more kids can spend outside, the better. The other thing is, uh, you know, in the environmental risk factors is that we talked about having things, holding them up too close or reading for too long. And so one of the things that we tell all of our patients and all of our parents right now is to take frequent breaks. And we tell them it's the 2020 rule, 2020 20 rule. So it's every 20 minutes, they need to take at least a 20 second break to give their eyes a, re, a, a break from focusing. And they need to look at least 20 feet away. So what happens is if you don't tell them the 20 feet away part is they stop focusing on their coursework or their classwork and they switch to their phone and they're doing something else during that time. And so that's not helpful. We need these kids to be looking far away, looking out a window, you know, walking down a hallway, something that's getting them looking in the distance and taking that break is needed. Um, so, so in summary, here, here are some references, but, but in summary, you know, the, um, the, the biggest problem right now for these kids in COVID times, at least for behavior and visual function, is this worry that we're going to come out of this with a lot of kids with myopia and nearsightedness. And so the biggest thing that we can do for our patients, whether it's direct care from ophthalmology and optometry practices, or whether it's um, directly from our pediatricians who see these kids more than we do, is um, getting them to take breaks and frequent breaks as much as possible. Um, and uh, that's all I got for you guys for today. And I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I'll jump in, Rodney. That was great, really uh, clear and, and helpful. And been having a really hard time getting my kids to read 45 minutes. So um, now you're telling me I have to have them read less. Uh, I'll <laughs> have to find the balance there, I guess. But um, my question, I guess, is, is so we've had the, the pandemic has been like 10 months now. Um, and so it's 10 months of a lot more screen time. At what point would you expect to see um, uh, you know, on a population level, uh, an increased prevalence. Uh, when when would this start to manifest? And, and I guess a follow up to that would be, what what are the what age ranges do you think are most vulnerable? Yeah, so so that's a good question, and I and unfortunately, I'm probably not going to have a lot of answers to that. So um, so the first thing is, I think we're starting to see it manifest a little bit now. Um, we're getting more and more kids coming in to see us because they have a blurred vision in the distance. The problem though, is that um, because they're spending so much time focusing it near, we don't know until we do their eye exam and we put drops in their eyes, if the, the problem is actually that they're, they've become nearsighted or that their focusing system has just over-focused for up close. And when they look far away, they don't like relax it. It's almost like a spasm. And so we have to put these drops in these kids in order to be able to tell which one of those it is. The other thing that we're not 100% sure about is, is this change transient? So is it that even when we put the drops in, we're able to completely relax the focusing system and they're really myopic? Or is it that they, they tightened up so much that when we do the drops, we can't completely relax it? And so we might find that some of the kids that we think are nearsighted maybe weren't. We just weren't relaxing their system as much. And so a lot of doctors with kids, they don't necessarily want to put eye drops in. Um, and, and so 
especially doctors who are not specific to, to pediatrics. And so if you go to a general care eye doctor or something, um, you know, a lot of times adult doctors think about, well, you know, we don't like to have our eyes dilated. And so they don't want to do it to a kid. Or if they're not used to working with children, then the kids cry and they do all of those things and they don't know what to do with it. So they just skip the drops. And the problem with that is that, um, you know, they might be over diagnosing myopia. And we don't know what happens if you prescribe when they shouldn't have glasses. And so it, are you almost like making them grow into their myopic prescription if it was like a, a mistake on the prescription and they're not actually nearsighted? And so there's a lot of these little sort of caveat things that we don't know the, the full answer to. So we are seeing more and more kids come in um, that are symptomatic, but a lot of them are symptomatic because of all the increased near work. And so it's sort of what I do to manage these kids is I leave them a little bit nearsighted, but I see them for follow-ups to see, is it really there? Or is it kind of going away once they've tried to take these breaks and all of those other things? But, um, you know, it's like the million dollar question right now. That's what everybody wants to know. And like I said, I answer that question, you know, 75% of my day. And, um, you know, and, and I, I actually probably don't answer the question 75% of the day because we don't know the answer. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dr. Roberts, there is one more question uh, on the um, Q&A. What is the thought about what prevents myopia with outdoor time? Is it sun exposure or looking at distances or unknown? Yeah, so right now it's actually unknown. So the early studies that looked at um, the outdoor time really just looked at outdoor time. They didn't look to see what the kids were doing outdoors. And so were they outside looking in the distance and running and playing and doing those things or were they outside reading a book, you know? And so we don't know the difference between those, but there's a lot of people who are looking at that right now. There's a, a whole bunch of um, money being poured into that through the NIH, as well as in other countries like Singapore, China, Japan, et cetera. So, um, because it really is a, a, a huge public health concern because that, like that graph I showed that incidence just keeps climbing. So we can't figure out exactly what, what piece is pr protective. Thank you so much uh, for that session. Uh, now we'll move on to ENT. We have Dr. Zara Patel. She's an associate professor of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at Stanford. She's the director of endoscopic skull-based surgery and director for rhinology fellowship here. Welcome Dr. Patel and you have the floor. Wonderful, thank you so much for having me. Um, it was great listening to these other two talks, very informative. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm gonna be wrapping us up with um, talking about the ENT um, part of this in COVID-19. And this is a pediatric talk, so we're gonna talk about peds, but full disclosure on that, I am not specifically a pediatric otolaryngologist myself. I'm actually a subspecialist in uh, sinus surgery and skull base surgery. And so I do, do definitely see pediatric children um, in my clinic and in, in our Stanford clinic. And I see, I do a lot of pediatric surgery, but I'm not actually part of the PZ and T division that probably many of you know so well. And they are all wonderful uh, people, but I'm, I'm not part of that division. <laughs> but uh, I, have, um, I have dealt a lot with COVID-19 in particular. And so that's why they, they thought I might be best to give this talk. These are my disclosures, uh, none are relevant to this. So um, just starting off, you know, this is probably a slide that is very familiar to all of you by now. It was kind of the earliest data that we had to work with at the very beginning in March of last year when we started trying to investigate um, what was going on with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And um, just to refresh your memory, uh, what we realized very early was that uh, the viral load um, detected in asymptomatic patients with similar and symptomatic patients. And the area in the body that there seemed to be the highest viral load was in the nose and throat, and specifically the nasopharynx, which is why the test is designed the way that it's designed now. And to add to that, um, something that we had very early on was this data about um, whether or not the virus could be aerosolized. And um, this study that was put out basically showed that SARS-CoV-2 is stable in an aerosolized form for at least three hours. That's just how long they tested it for. They didn't know how long further than that it may stay. And that didn't mean anything about 
viability of virus, contagiousness, if you walked into a cloud of that virus, but at least we had this, um, these two points of data early on. Combining that with um, some other real world type of data that was coming out of China very early on, this is just one example of many of uh, sort of um, examples where they tried to do this contact tracing. So this, for example, is a Hunan bus and that red uh, person is the initial COVID-19 carrier. And you can see that the orange people were COVID-19 infected. Um, the blue person was infected with no symptoms. The grays were uninfected. The most interesting thing about this uh, slide is the pink person. The pink person got onto this bus 30 minutes after the initial carrier had disembarked. And, and there was lots of stories like this going around at the very beginning of the pandemic. And so, although uh, it took the CDC many, many months uh, to, to come out and say that this was a respiratory pathogen, in an otolaryngologist's mind, um, we were thinking about this as a respiratory pathogen very early on um, because also of this, which likely all of you know very well at this point, the ACE2 receptor, which is how the virus binds to our cellular structure and enters our body, um, there's a very high prevalence of that in our nasal cavity, specifically up in the olfactory epithelium um, in and around our olfactory neurons. So um, this is a, uh, this is actually, it turned into an editorial letter, but it initially was just an internal email that was kind of went viral and escaped out of Stanford um, because as soon as we started hearing these bits of data points and started talking with our colleagues around the world, we realized that perhaps otolaryngologists were going to be much more a part of the front line of providers in COVID-19 pandemic than we had initially anticipated because of this high vir viral load in the nose and throat, because of how most of the procedures we do create aerosol, our, our aerosol generating procedures, and the fact that we do those procedures both in the operating room and in the clinic. Uh, we also started hearing cases of, you know, in China, in Iran, in Italy, of super spreader events where um, specifically endoscopic skull base surgery um, was starting to infect many more um, sort of staff and, and patients um, from one particular procedure. So um, that was way back in March that we started thinking about it this way. And we started getting a lot more actual data further on in the months to follow. Um, we here at Stanford and then many of our colleagues started trying to actually look at um, procedures and, and use optical tracer imaging to see which of our procedures were aerosol generating, which are not. The long story short is that there's a lot of conflicting data about this, but as many of you likely know at this point, we now know that just talking, laughing, um, singing creates aerosol in a room. And so really any environment in which there's a lot of airflow coming out of your patient is going to be high risk for the spread of COVID-19. Now pair that with a pediatric patient population where there's uh, a lot of laughter usually in a pediatric encounter. There's a lot of um, possibly talking, screaming, laughing, um, and unfortunately, when you try to look into the holes of a tiny little patient, <laughs> sometimes there's screaming <laughs> that happens with that. And so um, likely a lot of aerosol generate, generation, both in the clinic and in the operating room with um, ENT. We tried to put together some uh, recommendations early on about how to deal with this. And really it comes down to you know what we have right now as our standard and and what we developed early on and kind of have changed over time. But the immediate effect was that at the very beginning, like many of your other clinics, only urgent patients were scheduled and all others were canceled. You have to go through their screening, their temperature checks, specifically how pediatric patients may be affected in an ENT setting is that, you know, it's, it's scary to have uh, us coming at you with our instruments. Even adults are scary when I approach them with a scope. Uh, uh, so, you know, a little kid having someone who they see the whole face, we can be talking and laughing and, and making ourselves into gentle human beings. It's a lot easier to deal with someone like that looking inside your nose versus someone who has two masks, a 995 covered by another mask, covered by a face shield. 
you can imagine the response to that that person approaching you with a, a rigid scope is going to be a lot different. And so even the patients that were urgent that really did need to be seen um, for tumors and other emergent types of things, the patient interaction became much more difficult and, and continues to be. In the operating room, um, you know, of course, at the beginning when we realized this, all our urgent, uh, all our, sorry, non-urgent emergent cases were canceled until we could get the appropriate protocols in place. And still to this day, any aerosol generating procedure, which is really any endonasal procedure um, and probably most um, laryngology procedures, uh, we need an N95 and full, you know, um, gear. Now, kind of shifting a bit, you know, most of us very rapidly switched into telemedicine um, when it when we were during that time when we couldn't see patients in clinic, and uh, just like you know, in in the rest of this. ENT is particularly challenged by, by telemedicine because we really need to look inside these deep cavities, you know, into the ear, into the nose, into the mouth. There are some companies like this one, for example, Tidocara, that came out with, started developing these um, things that parents could use to kind of transmit via an iPhone to their provider pictures of what was going on. And this actually works really nicely for the ear, but, uh, and you can see actually even into the mouth, but looking way deep into the throat and looking into the nose, um, they haven't even tried to get parents to do this because you can actually do a lot of harm sticking things into someone's nose, into your kid's nose. So uh, we'll see how this field develops, this space develops, because um, certainly I think we'll be challenged like this in the future again. The other thing to consider is that um, there are specific patients who already have pulmonary comorbidities. Most often our rhinology patients, for example, cystic fibrosis patients, but there's a whole host of, you know, syndromic patients that um, have ENT types of manifestations along with pulmonary manifestations. And um, the question becomes, you know, how does COVID-19 affect that, stressing the already stressed unified airway, which we call, you know, this entire upper and lower respiratory tract. And the, the, the answer is we really don't know at this point. I think that all of us have been very careful in cautioning our patients who have these underlying predisposing factors to just be as careful as possible, mask as much as possible, stay at home as much as possible, um, not come into uh, any healthcare setting or other environment unless they absolutely have to because we really don't know what exposure to them is going to entail in the um, big data sense. Even um, patients who don't have underlying pulmonary issues um, has become a challenge for otolaryngologists. For example, uh, a pediatric patient coming into the emergency room with a unilateral pulmonary consolidation. Um, typically, this would be really easy. This would be a likely bronchial foreign body, and we'd have to just take them, you know, um, get imaging, take the EOR, take it out. COVID-19 actually presents quite frequently. About a third of patients with pulmonary manifestations will have unilateral consolidation. And so this just kind of um, plays into the challenges of how COVID-19 has brought about challenges in both diagnosis and management for these patients. So harking back to that initial uh, sort of alarm that we sounded back in March, what we also noted at that time from our Italian colleagues was the high rate of smell loss that they themselves were manifesting as providers. And, you know, we work with people who have smell loss all the time, but due to multiple um, etiologies, but certainly that wasn't causing smell loss in the providers at that rate. And so we started thinking very early on that this may be something that we should think about in relation to COVID-19. What you also saw um, in the lay press and media uh, was that the search popularity index for loss of smell definitely tracked as far as COVID-19 um, infection rate. So if you can think back to when New York was the uh, epicenter of the pandemic around the world, if you look at the search popularity index, you can see that within the United States, definitely New York was the highest. Now, some people will criticize this data and say, well, when people start hearing that loss of smell is related to COVID-19, well, that's why people start searching about it more. But if you look at some Italian data, that actually was not true. The very first uh, report published that was identifying lack of smell as a symptom came after that initial spike in Google searches in Italy. So this definitely was something that 
um, was something that you can actually use to track the pandemic and became very helpful actually in areas where the countries actually did not have a good way of tracking their own cases. So for example, in Ecuador, they were seeing satellite images of hundreds of bodies piled on the streets in Guayaquil, and yet the actual rate reported from Ecuador was in the single digits. Now, this obviously um, represented a, a problem with reporting, a problem with being able to collect data because of their infrastructure, um, but just looking at their search terms in, in the internet, it correlated with this huge number of bodies that we were seeing in the street, also correlated to searching about loss of smell. So it's something that we can actually use in future. Um, if, if this pandemic continues, I hope it doesn't, but if it does, it's something that we can actually use to track even in countries that don't have good reporting measures. Finally, uh, in April, we got the first reports of actual looking at it in patients with COVID-19. This is something that actually changed and developed over the course of the pandemic and, and based on regionality. And this likely has to do with the changing variants that we have seen of COVID-19 and how much that may affect the olfactory epithelium. You can see that in China, it was really only a five to 6% rate that was reported that jumped to 15 to 30% in South Korea. And then in, in the European countries, this became 30 to 40 to even you know 60% of the patients to the point where France started using this to actually try to triage their citizens as to whether or not they had smell loss. Thankfully, I was um, working with our administration here and Stanford um, was very responsive and added it uh, at our request to the list of COVID screening questions. And I was also consulting for the CDC at that time, pushing that this should be added to the national recommendation for screening symptoms. And they finally announced that on April 20th as well. And, and now hopefully all of you know that that is one of the, the um, earliest signs, one of the major signs in otherwise asymptomatic patients that you should be asking about. So um, in spite of all of that, the WHO still did not add it to their list of symptoms and we published yet again on this. And finally in May, they added it to their list too. Uh, there eventually became confirmatory data, meaning actual scratch and sniff objective testing that confirmed this. The reason that this is important and the reason that it's relative to the pediatric patient population is that we know that subjective loss of smell does not always correlate very well to objective testing of smell meaning that people don't always know that they can't smell very well. And so this becomes more difficult in the pediatric patient population because we don't really have as good of tests when we get to you know really little kids who can't just do a scratch and sniff or who don't have a, a wide variety of smells that they're familiar with yet. And so um, there are definitely different ways of dealing with this and, and multiple different tests are trying to be de um, developed at this time for kids, but um, definitely in you know, I would say any kid that's six or older, they could probably use adult scratch and sniff tests and get a relative objective data from that. Keep in mind when you're thinking about um, the pediatric patient population that congenital anosmia is actually the most common um, thing. And so heightened public awareness is actually leading to increased conversations between parents and kids about whether they can smell. And it may not always be COVID related. There's Kalman syndrome, which hopefully all of you know about the, the way to deal with that is obtaining a karyotype, getting an MRI and specifically asking for attention to the olfactory system is important. And it's not actually just smell loss. Um, I'm part of this global consortium and we've realized through um, you know, surveying thousands of patients that it's actually severe impairments of, of taste not related to the olfactory sense, as well as chemesthesis, meaning the trigeminal nerve is also affected. And as we continue on down the pandemic, we realize that probably all cranial nerves can be affected in some way. The interesting thing about specifically COVID-19 olfactory dysfunction is that parosmia or a distortion of smell is actually much more commonly seen in this patient population versus other post-viral losses. And it's something that we're trying to study a little bit more here. I don't have enough time. I could give a whole other talk on treatments of post-viral loss. So um, number one, you can just refer to me if you have a patient uh, that needs treatment, but there is this um, primer that we published, we tried to put out just for you know basic, uh, basic treatment of post-viral olfactory loss. Um, the very basics are there's something called olfactory training that is quite helpful. And I did a randomized control trial showing that that can help people. That wasn't in pediatric patients specifically, but we did have some pediatric patients enrolled. 
And then um, steroid irrigations, depending on the age of the patient, the severity of their illness, how impactful it is on their quality of life, um, we can decide whether or not it's worthwhile to give pediatric patient populations a steroid irrigation and, and just monitor for any systemic absorption, which in adults, we really don't have any. And then finally, a lot of people jumped to giving steroids for this because um, we do that for other types of loss, for example, traumatic um, olfactory loss. But this is not something that has been proven to help um, in post-viral loss, and I would not recommend that. So that's a, a brief whirlwind of how otolaryngology has been affected by COVID-19, specifically in the pediatric patient population. Um, if you have any other questions, you can email me on the Stanford email, or this is my Instagram and Twitter, and you can always um, follow me there, and I will take questions. I have a quick question. Um, but thank you for that talk. All of you guys, this, I learned a lot today. Um, I mean, so in Osmia, you're, I think one of those studies you published was 2017. Obviously, this is not new. Can you talk about just how different it is for this virus compared to other viruses? And I guess maybe before COVID, what percentage of all of your anosmia or, or, or reduced smell um, cases were infectious versus other causes? Yeah, so it's definitely not new. Um, this was a very um, sort of classic presentation that, that I kind of expected when I heard about COVID-19 because there are lots of other coronaviruses and influenza viruses, rhinoviruses that all have the same post-viral olfactory loss. Now, as far as percentage, um, you know, when you have a specialized smell loss clinic, um, it, it kind of varies because there's so many, so there's over a hundred different reasons why people can lose their sense of smell. Um, but it, it was, I would say, probably at least a, a third of my patients presented with post-viral olfactory dysfunction. What is more uh, unique about COVID-19 is, first of all, it seems that more patients are able to recover from it spontaneously versus uh, all comers of post-viral olfactory dysfunction. About 70 to 75 percent is what we, you know, that's the kind of um, multiple different studies put together, will spontaneously resolve, usually within the first six weeks or so, and certainly shouldn't take any longer than three months. Now, that still leaves, you know, 25 to 30 percent of patients who are not going to resolve on their own. And the sooner those patients start some definitive intervention, the more likely we are to be able to help them. So I wouldn't wait the three months to see who's gonna resolve on their own. I would just send every single person that's COVID-19 and olfactory loss or any olfactory loss for definitive intervention because that is a primary prognostic factor in whether or not they're gonna bring it back. And then finally, um, the other unique factor about COVID-19 is this um, parosmia that we're seeing with it. We certainly saw that before with other post-viral olfactory dysfunction, but not at the same rate. It, it is a much higher rate I'm studying it, so I don't actually have the percentage yet to give you, but a much higher rate of parosmia and phantosmia that occurs even after patients feel like they've gotten their normal sense of smell all the way back. It can be like a month or, or some months later that suddenly things start smelling very weird and tasting terrible um, later on. You know, a question just popped up about um, derm referral. So um, maybe if Dr. Tu is still on, she can she can answer that in the chat. I, um, I, I would, Rajni, I, I was going to have one, one more quick question, um, and then I think we're unfortunately out of time. Um, unless Rajni, do you have any questions or? Yeah, the, oh, the, um, so you mentioned the lack of pediatric data, but I, I at least anecdotally, I'm not hearing much about this in kids. Maybe some of that is you know, that smaller kids aren't able to recognize it, but but the burden of, of much of what we're seeing with this is older kids anyway. And 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 is, I mean, are you hearing about it? Uh, the, lack, the fact that there are, are fewer ACE2 receptors in the nasopharynx in kids, maybe, could that maybe be one reason why we're not seeing it as much? Or what are, what are your thoughts? So that is entirely possible, but I will say that it is very typical that kids are not going to just like pipe up about not being able to smell. It's really only when parents start asking their kids, like, you know, you used to like eating that. Why don't you like eating that anymore? That kind of thing that then 
the the topic is sort of investigated a little bit more by the parents and then they realize that oh their kid hasn't been able to smell or taste anything the same for however long so it's really not something that kids are going to complain about and that's most likely why we we don't see a, like as much it's also true that age you know the the um, duration to definitive intervention is one major prognostic factor in olfactory loss age is the other factor so most kids who do have a COVID-19 related loss, about like 95% of them are going to resolve within a month. And so it's a very rapid transient loss and it doesn't seem to affect them long-term. And that's another reason why it's probably just happened and, and gone and you're not gonna hear about it. Well, um, thank you all. Hope to see uh, everyone next week and really special thanks to Drs. Tu and Roberts and Patel for educating us about the extra pulmonary manifestations of COVID. Thanks for having us. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.